Welcome to the second of five Ready for Business webinars in partnership with the Cayman Islands government. I'm Will Pinot, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Commerce. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Chamber's website and social media channels and may be seen and downloaded by other persons and organizations on the internet. By attending today's webinar, you agree that you have no objection for your name, video image, or comments posted in the chat being shared on the internet. I would ask you to keep your camera off and your microphone off on mute during the main presentation. We'll be accepting your questions in the chat feature during the presentation. Questions in the chat will be answered um, by people attending this seminar and webinar. And during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation, we'll also be putting microphones on so you can actually ask your questions as well. So the Ready for Business webinar series has been developed to prepare not only chamber members, the Cayman Islands Tourism Association members, and the wider community for the reopening of our borders and how we can coexist with COVID-19. The Chamber of Commerce represents over 600 businesses in the Cayman Islands, and we continue to offer guidance and support, standing as a trusted source of information during these, and particularly these times. We know there is much to be done to help you prepare your organization and for adjusting to our new normal. So it's important that we continue to work together. So thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, the, for best practices and protocols for COVID-19 safety in the workplace for the tourism sector. The format of today's webinar session is as follows. There's gonna be a, a 20 to 30 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. And today's speaker will try and answer as many of your questions as possible in the chat feature, as I mentioned. So we're gonna begin our presentation with, with our Director of Tourism, Rosa Harris. I'm gonna give a brief bio for Rosa. Many, many of you know Rosa. See, she's been Director of Tourism. Uh, she is the Director of Tourism. I believe she took on that position in 2014. And she has a long history with the department and within the tourism industry. She has over 21 years experience in the hospitality sector in the Cayman Islands and at the senior level and extensive hands-on experience in management, business leadership, and working with government officials, boards of directors, and advertising executives and tourism partners. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rosa right now so she can do her presentation. And then when we come back out of her presentation, I'll also introduce Therese and, um, at the HA at Public Health. So over to you, Rosa, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Will. Good afternoon, partners. Thank you for joining today's call or webinar, I should say. Um, it's my pleasure to give you an update on what our, our tourism team has been busy consulting, asking questions, seeking uh, best practice across the board uh, for those who have already opened and those um, named uh, sound resources for the safest reopening that we can execute for this weekend. So today's theme is the best practices and protocols for COVID-19 safety in the workplace, specifically for tourism. And uh, what we will cover, I'm just gonna swap my screen here. What we will cover today is why they're important, how were these best practices and protocols created, who do they apply to, what are the steps to take for safety and success, what are the specifics of the protocols, when should these protocols be implemented, where can more information be found. If we have time, we can talk a little bit about um, lateral flow test testing uh, for the workplace as well, because that is a key component to keeping our community safe. So I'll move right into the details. We're in this together. We know that tourism has a huge responsibility in welcoming visitors back to our shores whilst managing our business in a safe and secure way so that we can continue to operate and not have any subsequent lockdowns. I would say one measure of success 
is to remain open um, as we've waited so long for the borders to be relaxed over the last 20 plus months. So protocols can only work when we put them in action. We have to be disciplined. We have to make it a way of life. We all play a role ensuring that safety is never compromised. From everyone in your organization to the business continuity plans that you create, to the standards that you hold your staff, yourself, and your patrons to, it all plays a role in how we keep Cayman safe and how we, can, how we embark on the lifestyle of living with COVID in our community. The protocols were built to ensure that we can deliver a safe and managed came and kind experience for our guests. So taking into consideration our people. And when we say our people, we mean the teams that we work with, our families, as well as our visitors, those that we have welcomed here and said, come to Cayman, consider Cayman. It will take everybody in our industry to ensure that we have a safe reopening, which is why communication is so important. And I thank the chamber um, and the government communications team for this forum in order to provide these critical updates. Why are they important? Ensuring that our tourism industry is ready for reopening. You know, we always said that um, our responsibility is great. Our business thrives on telling persons all around the globe to come and travel to Cayman. We're the best of the best. But with COVID, we know that COVID is enabled and spread across the world because of travel. So we have an incredible responsibility in reopening tourism to ensure that we do the basics, you know, and, it, and everyone has agreed that the simple protocols washing your hands, social distancing, wearing a mask is going to be the key lifestyle for us moving forward. So these are protocols are important because creating a health and safety guidance for our industry so that no matter who is welcoming the guest into your business, no matter who you're interacting with, everybody knows what is expected. Everybody knows what the minimum requirements are and ensuring that our industry does its part in keeping Cayman safe. We all know that we live in an online social media driven community. So whether we like it or not, you know, I always like to say bad news does not age well. So communication is the key here. Communicating how we're managing tourism moving forward, communicating how we will deal with difficult situations is going to be the key to our success. So how are these practices and protocols created? We have had lots of focus groups. So we had lockdown protocols and that was suppression. So a year ago, we delivered when, the, when we reopened to the domestic economy and you know, restaurants became a bit more operational. Um, there were staycations happening. We delivered guidelines so businesses could restart their operations after a very rigid time of lockdown. Since then, in the last three to four months, we have been consulting with our private sector and that has ramped up over the last few weeks. So we've had many meetings with the Ministry of Health, and guidance from the chief medical officer. We've met with Department of Environmental Health and as you see on the screen here, we had some critical focus groups, focus group meetings recently to talk about and to answer probably questions that you have had today, but we've had representation from all of the subsectors within tourism advocating for what is happening in their business, what may happen and how things might be impacted and how we can handle it best. We've used the CARFA 2020 guidelines as the technical advice for public health. 
and the minimum standards for the sanitization protocols and guidelines, as well as Public Health England and other international health entities. And I'll mention here, I'll mention here that we also looked at our competitors. The one thing about being a, the late, a late entrant to reopening in the Caribbean is that we've had the benefit of watching other countries do it and learning from their reopening processes. And there's been some countries that have really generated some excellent documents and reference tools. And we've taken those into consideration in our protocols as well. Where do these protocols apply to? This, these categories of tourism have been expanded. We have accommodations, attractions, car rentals, restaurants, retail, taxi and public transport. Fishing and snorkeling is a new category for us. Scuba diving, and we will also add large events to the protocols, but large events we've agreed as a government is a national concern. We have lots of local events. We have lots of groups that travel together and we have lots of promoted large events. So what will come after opening is a national large events policy that will help us to host many different types of large events, whether that's 50 people, 250 people or more indoor and outdoor. So that's something for you to look forward to. And we're also heavily involved in the lateral flow test policy for the tourism sector as well, which will be released this week. But as of this evening, and the team is working to get these updated protocols uploaded to our KY following the webinar today, you will find these eight that are on the screen that have been updated and enhanced for ongoing management, not suppression, but ongoing safety considerations and protocols for the tourism sector. So what are the steps to take for safety and success? We recommend that all businesses take the following steps to keep all of your people. And I mentioned people are your teams, your guests, yourself as entrepreneurs, your families safe. And we recommend that you develop an official COVID-19 policy for your business. And you should outline the sanitization, health and safety protocols that you're, you expect of your staff, you expect that your staff to guide your patrons through, whether that's using hand sanitizer, whether that's social distancing, whatever that may be, wear, wearing of masks, depending on the environment. We expect you to, and suggest that you train all your staff members so that you have consistency with your policy and any new protocols that you put in place and that you use the personal pro protective equipment guidelines as outlined by CIG in its appropriate form and place. Testing is also required by the government of employees. It's a recommended sequential testing of twice per week uh, with at least two to three days between each test. This is the recommendation for lateral flow tests of your, of your staff. Um, we will have a specific policy for tourism, which will be a helpful guide to all tourism businesses. And that will re be released this week, as I mentioned previously. So what are the specific protocols? Um, because we have eight documents, they all take on a format. We outline in the guidance document, what is the best practice measure? What are the risks 
Is it to your customers? Is it to your staff? You know, what are the actions you should take to help control the risk? Who needs to take action? And it's a working document. You can print this document off. You can edit it for yourself. You can mark it up yourself to make it your own working document. What is your assigned control check? And how often do these control measures need to be applied? So we take you through the minimum standards for each, each area and each business can enhance that for their operation, what's unique to your operation, your location, et cetera. So some examples of this would be, we have here on the screen, attractions. Your, what are the risks at the entrance gift shop area? A risk might be door handles being touched for entrance or exit of that entrance door. Signage, what are the control risks? You might need signage telling your patrons what to do. Hand sanitizer available inside or outside of the main entrance. Other controls would be for all guests to use their hand sanitizer or only permitting a certain level of occupancy for the gift shop. And then the outline would be who's responsible for that action. The staff should monitor, manage social distancing and how frequent. Obviously this is the ongoing operation as long as the gift shop is open. So we have several examples here. We have another one for retail. Uh, what are the risks? Staff health. Uh, retail obviously sees a lot of foot traffic. So monitoring of your staff health, um, ongoing control measure, are they displaying symptoms? If they are, then you would follow the public health guidelines of sending them home, requiring them to test, checking up on results. So these are some of the business continuity measures that the guidelines help you think through uh, in support of reopening and your business. We have examples here for car rental, taxi, and tour. And again, a lot of, a lot of times you've got some specific uh, controls like for taxi and public transport. I'll just focus on that at the moment. At the moment, taxi and, and tour are limited to 50% occupancy inside the vehicle so that social distancing can be achieved. And one of the controls is for no passengers to be in the front seat. And the driver is in control of that measure at all times. So again, we have various um, measures and controls per category. We also have, will have a policy document for restaurants and bars in addition to DOT's guidelines and protocols because the restaurant and bars um, sector is quite a large sector with over 200, and 200 or 300 restaurants on island. So these are just some examples of what is the risk, what is the control, what is the measure, and who is responsible for it. So just to take you through how you might develop and assign within your business this guideline that we've produced and make it a working living document for your business to ensure that you have a measure of standard within your business. These are just some more examples. So I just want to get to always remember that this is what is expected of us. Mask wearing, social distance, sanitizing our hands, washing our hands for at least 20 seconds, using testing such as lateral flow tests to ensure that we know the status of our teams that are working in the businesses, isolating positive cases or persons showing flu-like symptoms immediately. 
And I know that this has been challenging because isolation is very difficult. Isolation can hamper the operational side of your business and having persons in your business to do the work. But you also have to think about your brand, how it might be damaging to your business as well if your customers learn that you're not testing and you're not having a handle on the level of COVID that might be present in your business that could be passed on to your clients. So it is a balance of everyone will be impacted in some way as we've experienced already with the current community spread. But if we're to have a lifestyle where we're open for business and tourism whilst managing through a pandemic, having an ongoing testing program for your teams is critical. And again, um, the last point here would be it is required of everyone who learns of a positive to report that positive to public health. So when should these protocols be implemented? As soon as possible, which is why we will have the protocols up on the ourkman.ky site this evening. You won't find um, lateral flow testing just yet. That'll be announced in the coming days. But for the most part, the sectors, the eight sectors that we shared earlier will have protocols on the Department of Tourism website as of this evening. And that's my next slide. So ourkman.ky, uh, explore.gov.ky, we will share our policies with the central government, but you can also find the regulations for phase four and the national policy for lateral flow testing on explore.gov.ky. And when the policy for the tourism sector of lateral flow comes out, you'll find that on both websites. We're trying to ensure that information is easily found for everyone. If you have specific questions, we have an email address, sanitation at caymanislands.ky. You can send your questions to DOT about anything reopening related. We're here to support all of our partners through this process. It's been a long awaited timeline and uh, we have to sharpen the saw again and get the, get the business going. And we're here to support you as your Department of Tourism in any way we can. Just so wanna thank you all and say that yes, we're still in this together. And as time goes by, things might change, strategies and protocols might change in order to adapt the business. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Rosa, very much. Excellent presentation. As I said, we also have Therese Prehe from the, she's the health promotion officer at, the Pub at Public Health and she'll be supporting this, uh, this webinar, either through answering your questions through the chat or any, um, I didn't know if uh, Therese had anything to add um, from what Rosa has said, whether there's any other information that public health may have. Hi everyone. Um, so thanks Rosa for that excellent presentation i'm trying to unblock um thanks rosa for that excellent presentation um just to add in support of what rosa had said regarding the lateral flow tests and how important it will be uh once the border reopens to ensure that if there are any positive cases within our community that they're identified as soon as possible because that's going to be one of the main um, ways that we're going to be able to identify um, our community COVID-19 status. And for retesting. And for obviously for retesting as well, retesting purposes. Now, I think, I mean, from what the information I'm hearing is obviously,
for, for somebody to go and say they're experiencing symptoms of COVID and they're an hourly paid employee and you know, they rely on their salaries to live, um, you know, what does the legislation say as to the requirement that that person has to actually report to their boss to say, listen, I'm experiencing symptoms, I need a lateral flow test, and, and again, once that lateral flow test is, is completed, uh, does that employee then give it to their employer the results, or do they report that directly to public health? So all, all, all positive results are reported to public health. Let me just hasten to say, though, that all communicable diseases are by law mandated to be reported. And so, yes, I understand that we are operating from an honor system, but it's also applicable to the, 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 the um, public health law of 2002 and that which was revised in 2020 and 21. So it, it is onus on the person if they discover that they are positive for it to be reported um, through public health, of course, and then results are provided to an employer um, just to, for verification purposes. And the employer, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the labor law concerning same, but I do understand that there are protocols yes. that are in place that businesses should follow. Yeah. That but will come up. We have a primarily. session coming up about the, lay, uh, the Labor Act um, right. in a few right. days. So we, we have really good conversation with some excellent speakers coming up on that as well. But there is a question in the chat regarding the lateral flow tests and about the availability of those on the island right now. And I know that the education system has been giving those lateral flow tests out for free uh, to the students and their parents. The question I have for you now, like in the United Kingdom, for example, I think the public health in the United Kingdom are giving out the lateral flow tests for free. Are there any plans for government to purchase a sufficient amount of lateral flow tests that will be provided to the, not only to the schools, but also maybe to uh, the general community and particularly Thank businesses? You take. Yeah, hey, well, um, Tim, Tim McLaughlin here. Um, yes, from what we do know, uh, Right now, government has purchased some and it will be handed out. I don't know how widely because I know that there's the same uh, drawdown for education department. Um, all, we're giving all the schools, whether government or private schools, uh, the lateral flow. Also for our healthcare workers and different um, frontline personnel, fire, police, et cetera. So I don't know if it's going to be for the general public at, at large or just for government entities. And okay. Well, I'm happy to give an update on behalf Thank of you. tourism. Um, our ministry has placed an order for approximately 200,000 lateral flow tests. And that was to assist tourism businesses to get it at the cost that the government would have purchased it for. Now, that order was placed a few weeks ago and has not arrived as yet. But I do know um, in the lead up to this coming weekend, I've been in touch with um, Mr. Woody Foster, who has confirmed that progressive distributors will have an all allocation of lateral flow tests available wholesale come November 22nd, Monday, November 22nd. So in the interim of the Cayman Islands government, having an allocation for tourism businesses to be able to acquire at an affordable rate, uh, Progressive would be an opportunity for our industry in the immediate sense. And, and uh, the other question I guess I have generally is um, how, how long do you anticipate in terms of uh, the administration of the lateral flow test? Is this something that is going to take us through to the next phase? Um, because once community transmission, it, it, which is happening now, 
um, spreads and the island really does, it, it spreads and it does, it runs its course like in other communities. Um, do you see lateral flow testing being part of the DNA for the tourism industry indefinitely? I would say yes. I would say for the recovery period. Um, right now we are reopening under phases four uh, and phase four is a six week window, but the government reserves the right to change the expiration date of that period. Uh, I do believe lateral flow tests will become a lifestyle in how we manage and, and get to understand more um, how we will get through the pandemic. DOT has done modeling based on other epidemics and health threats that have affected global travel. When you look at the last 10 to 20 years, our recovery has been 24 to sometimes as long as 36 months to recover from a significant event, be that health threat or economic threat. So I think that definitely in the medium term for the next two years, uh, obviously it's at the government's discretion how long the requirements put in place, but we should wrap our heads around lateral flow testing become a, becoming a way of life. Can you also just talk, talk us about, there are two particular sections, I think, which be interesting to hear your take on all of your consultation meetings with the industry sectors. The, the first one be, would be restaurants. Um, obviously, we have different types and varieties of restaurants, which makes us really unique as a destination. Um, do you think one size fits all, or are you kind of, uh, in your consultations, are, are they different types of, um, so for a takeout facility versus a fine dine facility, are they the same protocols or are they different? When we look at the operational requirement, it is having clean hands, covering your face and ensuring that you're not in the personal space of others. That is difficult to do when you're working on a team in a kitchen. Let's take that for example. So I would think that depending on the real estate the operator has, could be a small kitchen, could be a very large kitchen where you can space things out, but really and truly we're trying to have a normal lifestyle in some regard. And in my opinion, the testing component is key because if you know the status of your people, then you're almost, you can almost engineer the number of shifts or the teams that you assign to create some business continuity. That be that the days of the week that they work or the morning versus the afternoon, to ensure some level of continuity in your business. I believe that with protocols, they should be flexible enough for the business owner to make that decision themselves. Here are suggested guidelines that should keep the public safe, your team, your patrons, but how that works out operationally, everyone has a different layout, everyone has different equipment, large, small, a lot of square feet, small location. It's up to that entrepreneur to say, this is how I'm gonna design my business. These are the hours that I operate and this is how I'm gonna schedule my team. I think we also have to accept that the eventuality is we will all be impacted in some way. And it will be very difficult, especially for small operators. Maybe it's just the entrepreneur and one additional person or two. That probably means your business has to close completely. That's unfortunate, but unfortunately 
that's what COVID is with the isolation period. And there's no way to plan for that when you're dependent on the revenue, but you have to think about the eventuality of being impacted and the how you will cope. And I think that is what the protocols are supposed to do, to be proactive in how you operate to minimize your threat. The protocol doesn't just exist within the workplace. Well, it's how we live, where we choose to go, our exposure as normal citizens. You know, do we choose to get delivery? Do we choose to go to that indoor event or do we go to the outdoor event? We have personal choices too that feed into our exposure outside of the workplace. And if I could take it to the next phase, which is the water sports sector, um, obviously there are many small operators in that sector. And I know there have been changes in different protocols over time with regard to water sports equipment and everything else. So pretty much your guidance that you're providing is in keeping with, like you said, best practice. And it's very similar to what you're saying about the small restaurant operator. Again, you just have to be very mindful that if somebody tests positive in your organization, even if you're a small operator, it, it probably will affect you. Yes. I, I think for water sports, you know, Mr. Leacock is here on the call and um, some specifics like snorkel gear. We had um, brought up in our focus group that it should be bleached and hung out for 72 hours. Um, that's come back to us as, oh, it was a guideline. It wasn't necessarily regulation. And that has been decided to move to 24 hours, which is good. The dive sector right now has some ongoing rationale for the public health and CMO to consider as it relates to regulators. How can you safely desanitize a regulator under the 72 hour period that's currently in place. These are the types of examples of advocacy that we've been trying to have reviewed by government in support of our sector. So just to expand on some of those points as it relates to water sports and diving. Well, it's important because, you know, the gray areas are the ones that get you into trouble, right? So yeah. the, the better we have clear cut guidelines and they're and, you know acceptable by the industry as well, because as you, as you rightly pointed out, we want to keep open. We want to stay open and ensure that our tourism sector, it has a good product and um, people are going to be happy to return to us. So is anybody else on the call have any you can put your hand up or you can open your mic if you have a direct question for Rosa or Therese. So, well, just before any other questions, uh -huh. can we, I'd just like to add to what Rosa had mentioned a while ago regarding uh, how COVID-19 affects us community uh -huh. outside of the workplace. And that's definitely right because these are conversations that we need to start having with our families, our friends about how we make the decisions that will lead to our possible exposure to COVID-19, even as simple as how we want to be approached. Yes, as a Caribbean people, we understand that we normally meet and greet each other with a hug, but there are other ways and means now that we're gonna have to use to, 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 to greet each other. Instead of a, 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 a hug, it may be a handshake, it may be a thumb, thumbs up, you know, some, you may very well just have to start telling your friends and companions that um, hugs are just not, possible right now so that you're not meted and greeted in a way that you may be uncomfortable with per se for, for right now. So very important conversations that we need to be having um, as we move towards um, border reopening. Well, thank you. We do have a question in the chat regarding occupancy restrictions for the hotels. Maybe Rosa can enlighten us as to whether there are any restrictions. I would like to thank 
Adrienne, for the question. There aren't any restrictions to hotel occupancy. All visitors will be required to take a lateral flow test on day two, day five, and if they stay past a week, day 10 um, of their visit, where their arrival date is considered day zero. So given that our visitors will have the benefit of not doing a quarantine and being in the community, as long as they test negative, the hotels do not have an occupancy restriction in that regard. We do know that with our delayed reopening and our subsequent October to November delay, that has impacted initial return of business. So December's festive season, Christmas and New Year's is seeing a smaller level of occupancy going into January, we're being told maybe 30 or 40%. And that may return to about 50% of 2019 visitation levels in February. It is also supported by air seat availability. And as you would have seen in the media, there are a number of carriers that have committed to us like JetBlue, and uh, Air Canada, WestJet, and um, sorry, there's one that's leaving me outside of our national airline, of course, Cayman Airways and uh, British Airways, American Airlines returns in February, Delta returns in March, and we don't have a return date for Southwest just as yet. So all of this combined, we like to say airlift is our oxygen. Unless we have the seats coming in, there won't be the capacity to bring persons in. And it's a good way to reopen, not saying that we want to be railroaded by visitors, but it gives us an opportunity to test our protocols, test our business continuity plans, open in a measured way, so that we can kind of sharpen the saw because we've been out of practice for quite some time. So it's not all bad news. I don't think as well, limiting occupancy will um, really help with Delta, which is known to be so contagious. And Therese is the expert here, but uh, Delta being so contagious, um, we just need to ensure that we're getting persons who test negative into the destination and we're able to monitor any developed positives while they're here. There's another question in the chat from Saldana. Um, what's the capacity or number of customers inside retail shops measured by square foot or staff number? Have there been put any restrictions in that regard? Not to my no. knowledge. It's just been larger areas. So any large gathering, a hundred persons restricted indoors, 250 is allowed outdoors. And that is one policy, as I mentioned before, that we're looking at it from a national level. And we look at the lateral flow test as well. Dr. Lee has given us some advice to say, you know, if you want to have a large event, you may want to consider all of the attendees maybe taking a test 24 hours before. These are the options we're considering to be able to help persons um, with large events. But as for the business community for retail, uh, Ms. Saldana, I have not seen any restrictions in that regard. I believe what they're, what the government is trying to do is ensure that we have and get back to a normal lifestyle as best as possible and gauge the impact of COVID through lateral flow testing. So if you have not considered 
lateral flow testing for your team at your retail shop, that's something that you might want to consider doing twice a week to ensure that your, your staff are healthy and safe. And I see Linda asked a question about very similar to what I had asked around the, uh, the Taurus, who provides the Taurus with the flat lateral flow test kits. So at the moment, um, the government would like lateral flow tests to be certified, which means that, um, and we're, we're working on the lateral flow test policy. So anything that I share with you today is what we've considered in draft, okay? It's not official. So um, please don't hold me to it, too tough. Uh, but because we don't want an honor system as it relates to travelers, now that's visitors who travel in and returning residents, who travel in will have to take the day two, the day five, and the day 10. Depending on the arrival and departure date of the visitor, depends on if they take all three tests or maybe just two because they stayed a week. But for returning residents, they would have to take all three in order to be entered into the community again and. Um, not have to continue testing. So that has to be certified through a medical um, doctor's office, medical facility that does testing that's certified by government. Okay, and then there's another question regarding the, whether there's a mandatory number of rooms that the hotels need to keep vacant for isolation of tourists who test positive during their stay. Thank you, Jennifer, yeah. for that question. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. This is a really great question because we have such a diverse accommodation sector. We have the Airbnb and guest house cottage community, whereby you could be an entrepreneur and just have one, one um, unit that you're managing, scaling all the way up to hundreds of rooms at a large hotel. What we've done through our consultation, all of the facilities or most of the facilities that participated in our focus groups that are now certified government quarantine facilities will continue to offer this service as we reopen. What does that mean? If we have a guest that tests positive, those properties that our certified quarantine facilities would have an allocation of rooms that would allow for a guest to move into an isolation period. The protocols are very different in how the guest is managed when they are positive. So we would be looking towards the current quarantine facilities to continue to have a capacity of rooms set aside to help with isolation. And for those that have participated on our focus groups, they are also willing to support smaller properties that cannot offer isolation. So we do have um, protocols of how to deal with a COVID, a positive COVID-19 guest while they're in destination, how we may transfer them from one property to the other and how they're treated as, a, as in their isolation for that period. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, my other question would be that if there is a visitor who tests positive during their stay and they have to be transferred from a property that does not have the specific number of quarantine um, rooms available, and they have to be transferred to the other quarantine property. Who pays for that, Rosa? Great question. So we are encouraging or requiring all travelers to have travel insurance. Okay. Now, the primary concern with travel insurance is to ensure that anyone who tests positive can cover their potential health and medical related bills and potential hospitalization 
or medevac in, in terms of emergency. But we've also identified some solutions that cover accommodations expenses. There are packages out there that will offer coverage for an extended stay, an unexpected extended stay due to COVID. So anyone who is in need of this information, I'm happy to share it with you because that was also a great outcome of our focus group to share with the accommodation sector through CITA. There's a comment on the chat, um, Will, that talks about sister islands. And I just wanna, I wanna touch on that. It says, what about for the sister islands? There are no quarantine facilities on the island. The reason why I mentioned the hotels that offer quarantine facilities now is because they are well acquainted with how to handle a COVID positive guest. But in order to isolate, you do not have to be a quarantine facility. You just cannot be in the public while you're COVID positive. Our preference as a government would be for those who test positive while on holiday to remain where they are, where they're staying. But if that's not possible, let's say there's, it just so happened that on your departure day, you test positive and that property has someone else coming in for the same unit, we would have to figure out who goes where. So it is in those instances where the larger properties on Grand Cayman could be a support to smaller properties. But we're moving away from talking about quarantine to referencing it as isolation. Anyone can isolate in place. So there are some other questions there. Um, is there somebody who wants to ask a question? I thought I heard a voice. Okay. Um, you see the next question there about um, what is the isolation length? There's one that Adrian asked about. Yes, yeah, so that would be, Therese, do you want to take that based on public health? Mm -hmm. I will take that. Yes, okay. So basically, if you're coming in and you're fully vaccinated, then your isolation uh, time is actually 11 days. It's uh, 10 days plus then and one day for testing, in the next day for testing. Uh, we would use the same uh, time when you arrive as day zero, the next day is day one. Um, or when you're positive, uh, when you become positive, we use the next day as day one. Um, and that's 11 days for a person that's fully vaccinated and 14 days because that is the uh, incubation period of the disease for persons that are that are not vaccinated plus uh, one day. So that's actually testing on day 15. So yeah, that's the uh, where we have it set up now. And, and that goes throughout, whether it's lateral flow or PCR tests, because we would, we would consider the lateral flow because it is sensitive enough to pick up you when you're positive. Uh, we would consider that as if it's a PCR, but you would have to be tested by PCR in order to uh, exit the isolation time. Because after, after two or three days, uh, the lateral flow will never, will not pick you up again because it's an antigen test and it doesn't go as high as the PCR. The PCR is very specific. Uh, you would be tested negative by lateral flow after two or three days once you were positive. So uh, that's why I tell people, do not waste your lateral flow kits once you already know that you're positive. Uh, get tested by PCR on your 11th day or, or 15th day uh, to exit. Okay. Does anybody else have any any questions that they'd like to put forward? Um, again, a couple of chats, questions. I think we've answered most of them. I think Jacqueline just wants to get the information about the travel insurance. And 
again, Rosa said that uh, you could send your email to sanitation at caymanislands.ky for your travel insurance. So again, um, any, if there are no further burning questions anybody may have, uh, either in the chat or putting your hand up for your uh, a question, I'm going to close off the webinar and just simply say, close off by saying thank you to Rosa, Therese, and uh, I didn't properly introduce you, you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I moved along, but thank you for your, your expert advice on everything um, for, the, for public health. And so the chamber, we encourage everyone from all organizations to stay up to date uh, with government regulations as we all work together to navigate the challenges brought about by COVID. And for all of those who are on this, this call today, uh, we'll be sending an email of today's attendees so that you'll get a link to, you can rewatch this if you had, if you missed any part of it. It's gonna be posted to our YouTube channel as well as shared with the government network so that anybody who may want to get some information, they can, they can tune in at their leisure. So thank you for participating. I uh, thank again, Rosa and the public health officials for being with us today. And I look forward to welcome you all at the next webinar that we have coming up um, in the days ahead. So thank you and have a good afternoon.